I, I decided to, uh, I like to customize my talks, so it's like, a, and I wanted to make it look like you know something from London, and this is what represents your country here, uh, from what I was told. So uh, I hope I did a good job, and I uh, put it in the proper context, and I didn't shame myself even further, so, because we all love the Wombles, because, you know, they're adorable like me. So uh, that's the intro. This is, uh, this is what this talk is about. This talk is, I mean, I have to be honest with you, it is a one-hour long rant, cleverly disguised as a 45-minute talk. Okay, I mean straight up. It's I'm going to be ranting. I'm going to be you know, you know, rantyish. So uh, we're going to get that, and uh, and it's hopefully I'm going to talk about. In case you're wondering what it's going to be about, it's about how to get upper management buying to the security process, how to get uh, security awareness and stuff you know properly to the users, and how the infosec scene needs you know to die in a fire. And it's going to be done you know in more context and you know hopefully in a better manner than I'm doing it now. So let's start off with me. The one thing you need to know about me is that I have failed a lot of times. This is not a talk directed at what you're doing wrong. This is a talk about the things that I've done wrong. These are talks about my mistakes. Hopefully you can learn from some of my mistakes and, and, and not repeat them. And, or if you are, you know, you can correct them. So it's not when I, when I go out and I'm like getting into it and stuff, you know, I'm not just talking about how the industry and stuff, you know, I'm included in that. I've made these mistakes. So there's no unguilty person. And I, I like to describe myself as the paranoid guy. I've told businesses, you pay me to be paranoid. It's part of what I do. Having a gun on stage doesn't help very much. <laughs> it's, like so, it's like for a paranoid guy. So uh, we'll see what goes on from there. The one thing is like, what does this talk about? This talk is uh, a talk from 2005. I did a talk 2005 called Selling Elephant Whistles. It was about getting upper management buying to the security process. And um, I was told back then, I was giving it to some colleges and some local groups, and I was actually told at some security conferences and hacking conferences, like, yeah, we're not gonna want that talk as a defensive talk. We like offensive red team talks. And I was like, okay, fine. So I did some red team offensive talks, and then I said, you know, screw it. I'm gonna see if I can, you know, sneak a defensive talk in, you know, at some conferences. And 44Con was one of the cool ones that was like, you know what, let's hear it and, and see what you have to say. Uh, the title, Selling Elephant Whistles, is actually based off of a very bad joke and stuff you know, that I heard in America, which was called, uh, a guy was walking down the street and he sees a man with a, uh, with a shoebox. And the shoebox says, let's say, elephant whistles, 20 pounds. And these cheap plastic whistles. And the guy goes to the man, it's like, why am I going to buy a cheap plastic whistle for 20 pounds? And the guy goes, man, well, no, these are elephant whistles. Their tune is specifically crafted and stuff. You know, elephants can't stand the sound of it. They won't stampede. They won't be anywhere near it. It's like you, you won't have to worry about elephants. And the guy goes like, well, how do I know it's going to work? And the man looks around. Do you see any elephants? <laughs> I told you it was a bad joke right up front, okay? So it's like, I don't want to hear the groaning, okay? But it's true because what do we do in information security? End of the year... We go to our CIOs and we say, hey, we need another $200,000 for this sim. We need another uh, couple hundred thousand dollars for the licensing on this product. Oh, and we may need to do a restructure and stuff, you know, which will co cost, you know, half a million. Uh, let's get that done. And, and, and the CIO is like, well, what's all that for? Well, you notice how we haven't had any incidents or anything major happen into our company? He said, yeah. Well, to keep that from not happening and stuff, you know, we need all that more money. The better we do, the less we're seen doing anything. It's like there's a movie called The Recruit in the U.S. And so, you know, it's like where the guy talks with the CIA. It's like our successes are, are, are secret. Our failures are public. So, and that's one of the problems that we have. How do we get management to understand our process so they understand that? And that's what sort of this talk is about, along with the users and some other stuff. Now, like I said, I rant. So I decided and stuff, you know, for two things. I needed to start using memes. So I use a lot of memes in my slide. Uh, I'm nice enough to put a little Googleable search term to the left in case you don't know what that meme's about. You can Google it later and go, okay, that was funny. It's like I didn't understand it at first, you know. Or you'll say, yeah, he still sucks. But still, it's like I like to use memes. And also, our industry is a great use of memes because memes are trying to say a different thing like five different thousand times trying to say the same thing. It's like we're trying to say, you know, you need, uh, how, many time, how many different ways can you say you need to change your password or you need a firewall or you need an IDS system? It's like, so that's the same thing with memes. It's like you get that one theme and you try to keep putting different messages to it, but it's basically the same thing. Now let's start talking about management. We have a problem with management. It's like we have a problem with management. It's because of our perception of management. 
We think uh, management's clueless. We think that the, you know, the best thing about doing, uh, the best successful thing that you can have interaction with your boss is you know, not seeing him. It's like, or him not seeing you. That's wrong. We need to understand that upper management knows what they're, they're doing. They're running the business. That's their job. That's what they're supposed to be doing. They're not supposed to be understanding how firewalls work or IDS systems work. That's our job, to correctly tell them and explain it to them and educate them on those. That's what we have to do. So this whole uh, excuse of like, oh, I've got a stupid boss, you know, the, the pointy-haired boss in Dilbert, that's a crutch our industry has been using way too long. Because if we can ridicule and mock our CIOs and CSOs and our CEOs, if we can mock those guys and just consider that they're just too stupid to understand us, then we don't have to really work at trying to communicate and getting the problem solved. That's our failure. That's what we need to start doing and start learning how to communicate them properly. And this is some of the things that we can do. One of the things we need to do is what I call create situational awareness for our CIOs. It's like, and for our IT managers, and stuff, you know, we need to create what I call our high threat, low impact events. They're high threats because of the fact that it's like, you know, this could really, you know, totally destroy your company. They could really, you know, lose millions of dollars, but it's a low impact because of the fact that you hired a, a red team or you hired a vulnerability assessment or you're doing it yourself or your employees are doing this and it's a managed attack. It's like, it's something that, that's occurred that y'all were aware of. And so therefore there's no really, you know, it's a very low impact because it wasn't, uh, it was a, a very low threat because y'all were uh, managing it but it could be a high threat because of the fact that if this was done in the real world, you're totally screwed. So one of the things that I like to do is like this brings up to a story that, that I had. Um, one of my uh, biggest, wonderfulest mistakes that I ever, you know, was in, in a part of was I just started this uh, company and the CIO comes to me. It's like after, you know, a couple months and he decides it'd be funny if we pulled an April Fool's joke. I worked for a financial uh, company, and he wanted to pull an April Fool's joke to the CEO, uh, the president of the, of the company. And I was like, sure, no problem. He didn't understand how thorough I am. He wanted me to do a phishing we uh, email and stuff, you know, to the, to the CEO and send it to him saying that, that our, our company was being phished. So what did I do? I scraped our website. I created a false website. I put an iframe in there to look like it was actually uh, capturing customer information. I then uh, created an email account, turned it saying it was at one of our customers, had them forward the phishing email that I did then created, and then forwarded it to the president and stuff, you know, saying he was fished, he was going to call the press and call uh, the Better Business Bureau and report him because he almost got bamboozled out of all of his money. And then I also changed all the DNS records and who his records to look like it was one of the other employees in the company. <laughs> I like to be thorough. So, uh, so eight o'clock, that morning, April Fool's Day on a Friday, I remember it distinctly, it's like, uh, I sent that email. 8.30, I'm sitting in the CIO's office with the CEO and the CEO of the company. Uh, CEO was somehow, you know, not in on the joke either. So it was just two of us that knew that this was, you know, April Fool's. So uh, we sit down and we show them what's going on and the, the uh, CIO was walking them through what occurred and what happened and stuff, you know. And then he pulls out the DNS records, which was the big, you know, ha ha, April Fools. And he hands it to the, to the president and the president looks at it and it's got one of the other guys who was in on the joke. It's got his name and stuff, you know, on the thing, but I created it exactly like a DNS, who is, who is record? So the president responds like, how did he get compromised? It's like, how did he get, is, he in, is, is his stuff at risk too? And you know that look you give the other guy when he knows a joke and you know the joke, but you realize the other people aren't getting that joke, you know that, yeah, we were given that look a lot. <laughs> and so finally the CIO had to break down and says, oh, it could be because it was uh, April Fool's Day. President, I kid you not, he looks at the papers and he's like, oh, April Fool's, funny. Stands up, walks out of the room. It was a Friday, so that was good. I had two whole days to get my resume updated. So uh, I, was, I was happy for that. It's like, you know, that was, that was a good thing. So uh, I, I finished, you know, getting my resume polished, and then I come in on Monday. It's like uh, my badge worked, which was, you know, a good sign. And I went up to the president of the company, and I explained to him one important thing, besides, you know, don't fire me, was that when I was scraping our website, guess what happened? An IDS alert went off. 
while I was doing something that I knew to be something bad, an IDS alert went off. An IDS alert I've never really paid attention to before. But guess what? Did that IDS alert now take a little bit more meaning because I know what I was doing when that occurred? And I explained that to the president with the whole you know, caveat, you know, don't fire me. It's like, and explained it to him. It's like, this is what goes on. That terrified them. So what did they do? They created an incident response plan for if a phishing attack actually did occur. They figured out, it's like, hey, we need to respond to this. This is not the best way to respond the way, you know, just, you know, oh, crap, what do we do? Let's have something to do. Four months later, four months later, our site actually was really fished. We put people in jail because of that, because we were able to track it back. We all had not one customer lost money. And it all started with an April Fool's joke. It's like, that was awesome. It's like, not at the time, but you know, I can look back now. It's like, because that created situational awareness. We have to learn how to, because it, let's face it, information security, we're proactive, correct? We are proactive. We are trying to prevent attacks. What is management? Management is reactive. So we have to learn how to proactively make management react in a proactive manner. Yeah, let's wrap that one around real quick. Yes, that. I didn't say our job was easy. It's just something that we have to do. So we have to create situations like this. We have to make sure that they understand that these are some of the things that you do, that these are some of the problems that are out there, so they understand how to properly react when they occur to them in a proactive manner. One of the, another way that we can do that is metrics. I love all the attitude of, you know, I'll oh, give an executive manager, give them, a, give them a chart. Oh, give them a pie chart. Give them a, oh yeah, they love the pie charts. Just, you know, just make a little pie chart, pretty colors, and they'll be fine. You know what? If that helps my management understand where I need the money, and it's like, you know, what's going on in my network, I'm going to make a pie chart. If that's going to help better defend my network, I'm going to make a couple pie charts. If it's going to help secure my company and make my job easier, I will bake him a pie. <laughs> because you know what those numbers do? They help you. Not by just doing the budget. Are you, t are you recording right now? Are you logging and are you keeping in on your metrics on how many spam emails come into your gateway that are like stopped at the, at the gateway that are filtered or dropped? Are you keeping metrics on that? Do you keep metrics on how many attacks come onto your firewall? How many are automated? How many look to be more advanced scans on your firewall? Are you keeping records on your IDS and stuff? You know, what kind of attacks are happening? Which ones are manual? Which ones are automatic? And which ones are coming into your network? Do you know what those are? That is information to help you better defend your network. Do you know what else they are? They are ways for you to show to management, this is what's going on. This is why we need this much more memory for our budget. Give it to me. That shows the, the, that makes visible the invisible attacks that they don't see. Use those to your advantage. Not only will you start learning more about what's going on to your network, but you will also start learning and stuff, you know, how to talk to management in a way that they understand that makes them more proactive in giving you the stuff that you need to better defend your network. This is going to help you. I don't know about the baking pie. That might or may not help you. It depends on your management. But it's like, a, but that stuff will help you. Another way to help, you know, with the situational awareness is being able to learn from others. So let me take a moment to say, thank you, Sony. It's like, a, and RSA, and Northrop Drummond, and, you know, LinkedIn, of course. LinkedIn was one of the best things to ever happen to information security. Because LinkedIn is the Facebook of corporations. So it's like, a CIO understands that impact. Oh, crap. My password, the same password I use, you know, for my email, my network login, my, you know, VPN token, my everything else, it's right there. It's like I better change some stuff, or they probably didn't. But still, that's something that we need to communicate to them. That gives us a way to communicate to management saying, have you understood what happened here? This is why it could possibly happen to us if we don't do X, Y, or Z, or this is the reason why it won't happen to us because we've done X, Y, or Z. We have a management meeting every two weeks at my company where we bring in uh, the, uh, the VPs of our networking and IT services and stuff, you know, and we put them down in the meeting and we talk about 
uh, where our patch levels are, where our securities are, what, what our servers are doing, our antivirus, all these things we have to review every two weeks. The first page of the agenda is two news stories every single time. Something relates to information security, just another little thing to help drive to the point this stuff is still going on. There are still information security issues out there that you need to be aware of. And hopefully they don't impact you directly because of a failing stuff you know that we did on our network. So use that opportunity. Use that opportunity to drive the whole thing is communication. Stop talking up to upper management and just using the crutch of like, you know, they don't understand. Make them understand. Teach them. It is not their job to know. It's like, but you know what? One of my failings is that I was, I was the guy. They brought me in to clean up the town. I was there, I saw this, I was like, dude, don't worry, I got this. You know, it's like I had it down. I was gonna tell you what was what, what to secure, and you're gonna be better for it. You're welcome. Guess what? I was wrong. That was my mistake. Because I'm not, my job was not there to be the sheriff. My job was not there to be the guy who explains and creates policies and makes the company more secure. If I, my CEO, he's gonna be running toward the cliff. My job is to explain to the CEO, hello, there's a cliff over there. Stop running, you know, cliffs are over, not good. It's like, you know what, my CEO, he's gonna keep running. And then I'm gonna come up to him and I'll say, dude, you're still running toward the cliff, okay? Here's a $500 parachute, you know, you can glide over, really safe and stuff, you know, you might even make your yacht and stuff, you should be good. Or here's an umbrella, it's $5 and stuff, you know, you could, you know, open it up, you know, think happy thoughts, do a Mary Poppins and you, you may, you know, cushion the blow a little bit. But here's your choices. It's like, stop running toward the cliff. And then he keeps running toward the cliff and he falls over the cliff. And that's not my problem. It's not even my job to look down and go, I told you so, to the remains. My job is to give them the information. My job is to show them where the risks are. Because the whole thing is, I'm trying to mitigate risk. I am not in the job to eliminate risk. That is not my job, that is not information security's job to eliminate risk. Our job is to mitigate risk so businesses can conduct business. Business will then say, here's all the risk I've mitigated, what should I do next? And said, so, well, if you're gonna just only mitigate this much risk, you can offset some risk. Get, getting insurance, getting third party vendors who have SLAs, it's like creating uh, uh, partnerships like that. And then you can offset some of that risk. And then guess what's gonna happen? Management's gonna come back to you and say, Okay, we've mitigated this much risk. It's like, okay, we've offset this much risk. We still have this much risk left. We're going to accept it. You're gonna to have to accept the risk because I know, we, I know this is a horrible thought and I hate having to say it, but companies require the internet. It's one of those facts that we don't like to discuss, but you know, it happens. It's like they still need the internet to conduct business. So we have to allow the internet at some point to come into our network. So it's just one of those things. So we have to learn accept risk. You gotta accept risk no matter what. I mean, you can do it, you, you, I, I do it by drinking lots of Pepsi and playing video games, okay? It's like, you may accept risk you know, another way and just, you know, just uh, tolerate it, but you've gotta learn how to understand that you're not going to be able to eliminate it. Because you're there so the business can conduct business. The business is not there so you can conduct security and work on you know, your firewalls or your research and go after the bad guys. That's not why they're there for. You're there for them to conduct business and help them with that. You're a facilitator of that, not a hindrance usually, or you hope so. But we do have a problem with that, don't we? Because we know we all get into that meeting and stuff, you know, and I start talking, you know, TCP IP three-way handshake and stuff, you know, and a Synac response and stuff, you know, how an ICMP, you know, Trojan went into our, our, our network, and I'm getting the, who did that help? It doesn't matter how good you are at your job. It does not matter 
how good at information security you are, how many certifications you have, how many degrees you have, how much experience in the field you have. If you don't know how to properly communicate those threats to management, you're useless. If you're not communicating the proper threats to management and letting them know what's going on and how to defend against it, you're wasting everybody's time. Because you need their help to make that happen. You want change, you need to properly communicate to them so those changes can occur. You don't cut them out of the process and just start doing it yourself. You can't just go and say, hey, you know what, I'm just going to put an extra firewall, they don't understand the problem. See how long that lasts. You have to learn how to start communicating business. Business doesn't need to learn how to communicate to information security. They'll never know, need to know how, what a firewall actually uh, stands for and what it's about if you're properly communicating to them the risk and why it's implemented to help prevent loss of goods and loss of business. That's how you approach it to them. It's not them having to take a course uh, and stuff, you know, and learn and take training. It's like it's us learning how to communicate to them. We're having the same problem with the users. It's like I am tired of the one phrase that I hear so much in information security. Stupid user. Stupid user clicked on a link. Stupid user went to a website. Stupid user answered. Stupid information security didn't properly train their employees. That's what I say. We have to start learning how to communicate and understanding and seeing what our users are. What are the users in your company? What are they? They are part of your information security department. And you need to start treating them as such. It's like, because I will tell you this, if you think a, an employee is stupid, if you think they don't understand computers, if you think they don't understand technology and they're never going to understand technology, take solitaire off that computer. You see how quick that sucker comes back. You block Facebook on the proxy, you see how long that takes. It's like there is one of the worst threats facing all mankind, the board employee. Oh, uh, it's Bob in accounting. Like took Facebook off, they freaking took solitaire, what can I do? Well, let me click around, let me start just clicking. Oh, I've got network neighborhood. What are all these things, servers? Here's a share, HR? Oh my gosh, freaking pay raises. Let me look through that Excel file. Was there any hacking done? No. It's like there have been more threats and risk and more incidents caused by board employees than malicious actions in the history of mankind right there. It's like that's what's done it. It's like so we need to start understanding that they can be educated, they can be trained. Are we training them properly? Are we letting them understand where they fit in the scheme of information security? The answer is no, not yet, but we need to start. We need to start by education. Employees are getting their home credit card information stolen. They're getting uh, frauds and, and, and credit card frauds happened on eBay and getting stuff stolen on eBay. These things are happening to them. They have, their children are contacting people on the internet. They don't know who they are. If they can't protect against that, why do they care about your data? Why do they care about in your employer's data if they can't even protect themselves at home? Stop trying to teach them how to protect corporate data. Stop it. Teach them how to protect themselves. Teach them the importance of passwords and why it helps on their Facebook profile to have a good password. Teach them the, the security settings in Gmail. Teach them how to do proper password policy. Teach them how to monitor their children's activities online and why it's important. Because guess what? When you start teaching them how to actually properly secure themselves, they naturally bring that to work. They will bring that behavior with them. So start teaching them how to do it better because they need to understand they're part of the information security team. 
You have to, under, you have to do that. You have to let them know. From the CEO to the mailroom, they're part of your information security team. Because you know why? They're your IDS system. They know when things look different. Who here has employees that know who to call when they get a suspicious email? When a suspicious person, don't even raise your hand, but who knows who has their employees that know that when a suspicious person comes through, they're supposed to, they're supposed to understand and, and report it to somebody? If they don't know who to report that to, if they don't know you exist, whose fault is that once again? Your employees should know who to contact when an incident occurs, not see the guy after it's already happened. We need to empower them. I get a guy, there's a guy at my work, I kid you not, he sends me spam emails. Oh, I seen the spam email, just wanted to forward it to you. He sends me spam emails from his home address to my work address just to let me know and be aware. Do you know what I say to that after the, the, the thousandth time? Thank you. Thank you for helping out. Thank you for looking at it. I'll, I'll keep an eye on it instead of, you know, thanks for giving me the heads up. Do you know why I do that? Not because I love spam email. Okay, so start, don't start spamming me more. So, oh, Jason likes this stuff. Let me start forwarding him some stuff. It's not that. It's because of the fact he thinks he's part of the information security team. He believes it. He understands it. And what is he doing? He's telling his coworkers about it. Oh yeah, I talked to the information security team. I've helped them out on some stuff. You know, I've sent them some emails. And that gets that kind of mentality out into the workforce. That's what you want. You want them part of it. You want them to understand that they're part of the team. First of all, they need to know you exist. Second of all, they need to know that you're not just gonna go there when something screws up. That you're there to help. That's the message you have to start working on. One of the ways that I do that, you know, is through enforcement. You gotta have proper enforcement. And, uh, you know, hopefully you all know the pepper spray cop. And it's like, uh, that's more the American version, I'm sure, for you guys. Uh, it's like, but uh, what we have to do is, and I'm not talking about negative enforcement. I'm talking about positive enforcement, not just negative. One of the things that we do in our company is that we go and we do a walkthrough where me and my team will walk through every floor of every building of every, uh, in every uh, state that we do business in, in all our facilities, we do a walkthrough. You know what we do? All we do is we walk around and we pick up keyboards. We pick up keyboards. While people are there, we say, can, excuse me, can I look at your keyboard real quick? And they'll say, why are you looking at my keyboard? Usually I say Tanzanian dust mites. But then, but then, I, then I tell them, it's like, oh, because of uh, the passwords. I'm checking for passwords. Unfortunately, especially at the beginning, we found some. And we had to write those up. We'd just take it from them. It's like, sorry. It's like we look around uh, when it was like later in the day, and someone's like left their laptop, we take the laptop. But what does that do to everybody in that, on that floor? They realize information security exists. There are actually real people behind you know, the messages that I have to read on the web or the emails that they send out. There's a direct real world correlation to this you know, nebulous you know, information security actually translate to some weird looking guy and stuff, you know, who's looking under my keyboard. I better start thinking a little bit more about security. Also, that's the positive way. It's like when you find someone that is like, we had a lady who turned in a USB drive in the parking lot. We wrote a feature on her and what she did and why it was so good and put it in the, the, uh, the newsletter. And she's like, you know, and you know, that's, you know, you know what that causes, right? Competition. Because there's Bob in accounting going, that freaking Sally getting in the newsletter. She's already head of the, the United Way and the cancer research and all this other stuff. You know, now she's got to be like the security mistress. Well, I can stop someone and be security conscious too. I can get my name written up in the newsletter. Sorry for all the Bobs out there, but you know, it's just my go-to guy. So it's like, so, so, so that, that's what we have to deal with. It's like you can create that kind of competition. That's a positive way to do enforcement. There's a negative way. We don't allow any kind of attachments in our email system. It's like, so when someone, uh, uh, any executable, so if there's an executable that goes to our email system, I get an alert. Within 15 minutes, if you're in my city, I'm at your desk. Excuse me, I need you to get up right now and get away from the keyboard. Thank you. Sit down. I start looking through the folders. I start looking at hidden folders. I start doing all kinds of running some programs. And I'm like, and I, I stand back up and, I, and he's still standing up. And I'm like, do you understand the, the security policy and stuff you know that we have in place here? 
Have you read that in the policy book? You did sign that before you started employment, correct? Do you understand that that has to be a follow to it every time? We don't allow executables in our email system because of the uh, threats that it could pose. I need you to make sure that you refrain from doing that again. You understand? Thank you. And then I walk away into the sunset. No, okay. So it's like, so you know what happens there? I didn't just educate him. He didn't lose his job. He didn't get written up, but I educated him quite, quite nicely. It's like I educated all the people around him quite nicely. All the other people that are going to be at the water cooler hearing about the story. And then the other people that are going to read it on the Facebook post to the other employees said, oh my God, Bob just got reamed out by the weird guy and stuff, you know, from security. It's like, so I educated all those people with that one incident. Those are opportunities for education. It's like use every enforcement as an opportunity to educate. We have to educate our employees. All this has come down to one important theme. Communication. We need to learn how to properly educate management, uh, the users, and ourselves. We have a communication problem in this industry. It's like, I mean, that's one of our biggest problems is we have a problem communicating. And you wouldn't know it and say, you know, when you see all these talks and you see all these conferences. But we do. It's like, uh, th this problem and stuff, you know, is like the scene. It's like, it is freaking cold here in London, by the way. It's like, so I didn't need the hoodie. But it's like, uh, we do have a problem where we got this scene in our industry and stuff, you know, where we're not really, you know, we're not really, there's a d distinct disconnect. And that disconnect is between these guys here in the industry. See, that's the industry right there. You know what the information security industry is? It's 90% of, the, of the, the industry is 90% of the people. And you know what they're doing? Their job. 9 a.m., they wake up, they go monitor IDS systems, they build out firewalls, they do security policy review, they do their job. Five o'clock happens, you know what happens? They get off work. They go back to the home and they spend time with those people I keep leaving. Uh, family, that's it. It's like, and they start doing things, you know, you know they'll go out and they'll you know, toss the football. Oops, you know, the, the other football that we, we do. It's like, uh, or they'll, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll play sports or they'll go fishing or they'll do all the things that I'm horrible at because I'm a lousy parent. It's like, they do that because this is their career. This is their job. It's not their passion, it's just, you know, it's a good job, makes good money. Is that bad? No. The internet wouldn't be running without that 90%. We need that 90%. The problem is we need that 90% to start joining the 8% that's right here, the community. You got 8% in the community. Guess what? That's you. Congratulations. Y'all are the community. You're here at conferences. You're trying to learn more. This isn't just a job, this is a passion. This is something that you're interested in. This is something that you'd like to do. This is something that you'd like to learn about. That's awesome. You go up and you do research, or you'll go to talk, you do blog posts, or you, you do those things. That's great. That's what we need. We need the community. The community is what makes everything else possible. The new threats that are coming out. It's like the, the, the response and remediation stuff, you know, the threats are already out there, are usually coming from people in the, the community. That's a great place to be. Unfortunately, we also have this. This is the scene. It's like that little pimple in the butt crack of our industry right there. That's the scene. <laughs> That's the guys and stuff, you know, who are like, you know, hello, everybody here. I'm here to tell you how you're doing everything wrong and, you know, not how to fix them, I'm just gonna tell you how you're doing everything wrong. It's like, uh, and I'm done now, so you will not see me anymore until the next conference, goodbye. It's those guys, the rock stars, hate them. It's like, they're the ones that are broadcasting out, not taking the time to learn anything, bring anything in. It's like, I am tired of hearing people talking about how they've broken something, and that's it. No solutions, this is how I've broken something. You know what, good job, show me how to fix it. I can, I, can tell you, I can tell you so many different ways to destroy the Mona Lisa. I mean, you can use razors, you can use acid, blowtorch, it's like, you know, some little scissors. It's like, I mean, there's some really creative ways I can destroy the Mona Lisa. Can I paint it? No. Take Michelangelo's David. 
you know, with a chisel, jackhammer, you know, a little mining pick. There's different ways I can destroy that sucker. Can I sculpt it? No. If you're going to learn how to break something, learn how to defend against it, learn how to give that information out so people can fix it as well. That's one of the things I think our industry is missing. It's like we get some of these people here that are so busy trying to break things to look cool and using all these astute attacks and stuff that are really creative and really awesome, but then not giving a solution to it. It's like, yes, thank you for letting me know that it's broken. I now know exactly how horribly screwed I am. That is great. Thank you. I'll sleep way better at night now. But I don't have a solution for it. And that, that, that doesn't help me. So we need that kind of attitude. And this is another thing that I love. When I talk about you know, rock stars and, and information security guys like that, it reminds me of this. This is done by Henry Rollins. It's, I don't know if you are familiar with Henry Rollins from Black Flag. It's like the Henry Rollins band. Awesome guy. He is an artist. He's an actor. He is a poet. It's like, and he is a singer for a punk rock band. He's like all those guys. Very renaissance. Listen to the stage manager and get on stage when they tell you to. No one has the time for your rock star BS. No one of the, none of the techs backstage care if you're David Bowie or the Milkman. When you act like a jerk, they are completely unimpressed with your infantile display that you might think comes with your dubious status. They're here hours before you building the stage. They'll be here hours after you leaving, after you leave tearing it down. They should get your salary and you should get theirs. Amen. That's what it's about. Anybody know David Lee? Not David Lee Roth, I'm not talking about rock stars. David Lee, policeman in Florida, patrolling his beat that he always patrols. Sees a car he doesn't usually uh, see in his neighborhood. Runs the plates. It was stolen. Pulls the guy over. Has to wrestle with the guy. Almost loses his life and arrests him. Gets, him, gets his man. You know who that man was? Ted Bundy. A lot of people even over here know who Ted Bundy is, the serial killer, right? Why don't we know David Lee? You know Why? He was doing his job. He wasn't doing that so he could get on a conference uh, uh, circuit and talk about how awesome it was to catch a serial killer. He was doing his job because it's what he was supposed to do. What about Rolf Mueller? Not a German techno band, I promise. It's like uh, him and his partner, they were in the streets of Detroit in a very poor section they see a guy coming in butt naked with a handcuff dangling from his wrist, you know, screaming at him. Did they automatically tase the dude? They automatically think, oh God, he's on PCP. It's like, you know, let's get him in the back. They listened to him. They listened to what he had to say. They went to the house he was talking about and they arrested Jeffrey Dahmer. Do you know why you don't know about that, those guys? They were doing their job. They weren't doing it so they could get a book deal or go on Oprah. They're doing it because that's what they're supposed to do. Is it okay to get some attention? Yes. But that's not what you're supposed to be doing it for. So we need to start understanding how we're supposed to be communicating. And one of the biggest problems with that is we're a very cynical bunch. <laughs> we are very cynical. I have talked to so many people with so many really great ideas, and one of the biggest things that comes back to me is, yeah, but I don't want anybody to you know, get shouted down. It's like, you know, you make the wrong comment. You, there are so many people here with great feedback, but they're just afraid to say something in public. They don't want to look wrong. They don't want to get you know, called out for that mistake. That's why I'm, I'm not having a question and answer period after this talk. I want you to come up to me individually and talk to me. Have a conversation with me. When you see me sitting around and stuff, you know, that's because I'm waiting for someone up to come up and say hi. I want to be approachable. I want people to converse. That's why I network. That's the reason why I come to these conferences. I don't come to these conferences to talk. I come here to learn. It's like, and I learn from you guys. So when you get these people out there that have this attitude, there's one important thing, because I'll tell you right now, it's like, and, and my, my failures are really public. It's like, and I have so many wonderfully glorious haters out there. Okay. I had to come to a point, and it was actually last year, where I realized I was spending so much of my time being self-conscious. So much of my time worried about what other people were saying about me. 
and why they weren't liking me. And oh my gosh, it's like, well, that guy doesn't like me anymore. So maybe I should do something else to make him. No. Do what you're doing and do it right. When you call, when you call someone, when someone calls you out, if it's a valid reason, accept it, admit it. When you disagree with it and say, maybe you didn't understand it, explain it to them. If they still say you're wrong, agree to disagree. But get over it. Because I have a problem, and my problem is you guys. Y'all are awesome. Y'all have research, and y'all aren't submitting it to conferences. You're not contributing to the community. There are people out in this audience right now that have a great blog post waiting to publish. They have a great talk that they can give, and they're not doing it. They're self-conscious, they don't think anybody's gonna like it, they don't like the research, someone's already done something similar to it. I had a guy who gave a talk at one conference that I was at, which was almost exactly like the talk that I gave last year, except for he, he made he tethered it to himself. My response, awesome. Because you took what I had and stuff, you know, and you went with it and you made it your own. That's what it's about. That means I accomplished something. I have nothing more to prove in this industry. I've done it. I've helped people talk and give talks. I've helped people work on their stuff. I have done that. Everything else is a bonus. So you guys have to understand that y'all have valuable information to contribute. You've got great venues to contribute it to. You've got B-Sides London here. You've got 44Con. I will not submit it to B-Sides anymore. Not because I don't believe in the conference. It's because I want to see local speakers. I want to learn from you. I want to see you guys up here giving talks. I want to see you guys adding. I created a website called Dissecting the Hack. The only reason is for it is for you to have a place to create a blog posting or to communicate with other people in the industry without having to f worry about someone flaming you. I make zero money on that. It costs me money every month. I run that site for the community. I've had people who've started and they started a blog post and they created another blog post and then they created a talk for my site. I've accomplished what I've needed to accomplish. I need to see you guys start accomplishing stuff. I need to see you guys start adding to the community. We need to start finding ways to get the industry to first off realize we exist and then communicate and bring them into the community. We need to start getting you guys to start understanding you have value, you have information, start sharing it with me. Because I get so tired of being at these conferences and seeing people that are so intelligent sitting in those chairs and not wanting to contribute to our community. It hurts. Y'all have valuable information to contribute. Start doing it. Don't do it on my site. Create your own site. Create your content. Start sharing it for us. Because until we start communicating and building each other up and start building this community up, it's just going to be where it's at. We're still going to have to deal with 90% of the industry who doesn't care that we exist and 2% that think they own it. Get into the community. Start contributing. Start making it better because you can. And I'm going to end on that note. <laughs> so, sorry, I get a little too passionate. I've got to calm down a little bit. So, there we go.